The second half of the 20th century was dominated by the rivalry between communist USSR and capitalist slash democratic USA, a contest known as the Cold War. The impact of this conflict was significant throughout the Arab world in this period. Lines of division were marked between traditionalist monarchies that maintained good relations with the West and progressive republics that sought to use Arab nationalism and Soviet aid to implement their own vision for the region. Before we begin, I just want to tell you that this video is a part of Project MAD, a collaboration between a bunch of different history YouTubers about the Cold War. Stick around till the end to check out the link to the rest of the videos in this awesome collab. On the one side were the predominantly secular republics, which were tied together by their nationalist outlook. On the other side were the monarchies of the region that were naturally more traditionalist in their political orientation. Out of these two blocs, the nationalist republicans were led by Egypt, whilst the monarchical states can be said to have been led by the oil-rich Saudi Arabia. Perhaps the most important individual throughout this conflict was Jamal Abdel Nasser, the Egyptian leader from 1954 to 1970. Nasser had been a key member of a group of army officers that had toppled the Egyptian monarchy in the Egyptian Revolution of 1952. This event can be seen as the most likely starting point for the Arab Cold War. In any case, Nasser's vision for Egypt would be exported to other sympathetic Arab states. Nasserism, as the Egyptian leader's ideological outlook came to be coined, endorsed a secular government which relied on socialist measures being taken at times and emphasizing the importance of pan-Arab unity. After his strategic victory against the combined trio of France, Israel and Britain in the Suez Crisis of 1956, Nasser became the darling of the Arab world. With his charisma and fiery speeches, Nasser was able to exert his influence throughout the Middle East. His assertive style won him many admirers in the armies and governments of other Arab states. Army officers and revolutionaries that espoused great admiration for the Egyptian leader came to power across Iraq, Algeria, Libya and Sudan during the 1950s and 60s. Part of Nasser's allure was that he was seen to be the poster boy for Arab nationalism, a powerful ideology in this period. Amidst the political euphoria brought about by calls for pan-Arab unity, several unions of Arab states were proposed and achieved. The most famous example of this was the United Arab Republic, formed from the political union of Egypt and Syria lasting from 1958 to 1961. To make matters worse for the conservative monarchies in the region, some of these revolutionaries had toppled pre-existing monarchies like the Hashemite Kingdom of Iraq in 1958, therefore unnerving the royal families of states such as Saudi Arabia and Jordan who would have been worried that they were next. Such was Nasser's popularity amongst Arabs that it even had a destabilizing effect on the seemingly stable Saudi Arabia. The Free Princes Movement was created in 1958 by Prince Talal ibn Abdulaziz, a son of the founder of Saudi Arabia, in order to propagate liberal ideas. The group clearly held Nasser in high regard. Its very name was inspired by the Free Officers Movement that Nasser was a leader of. In the end, Prince Talal reconciled with his family and nothing came of his movement. The threat to the Saudi royal family still persisted nonetheless. In 1969, there was a failed coup d'etat by Nasserist-inclined Saudi army officers. 
One of the ways Nasser skillfully spread his pan-Arab message was through the state-owned Radio Cairo, an Egyptian radio station which became the most popular radio station throughout the Arab world during Nasser's reign. At the same time, he sent out Egyptian teachers who would have been in line with his own ideological outlook to other Arab states. Meanwhile, the monarchist states did not take all of this lying down. They tried to form their own unions. For instance, in 1958, the Hashemite Arab Federation was formed when the kingdoms of Jordan and Iraq joined together. The union only lasted for six months due to a military coup in Iraq which toppled the monarchy. Saudi Arabia utilized its prestige as the land of the two holy cities, Mecca and Medina, to position itself as a leader of Islam's cause, thereby juxtaposing itself from Nasser's Egypt, which heralded itself as a leader of Arab nationalism. The Saudi government also had an active policy of exporting their own Wahhabi vision to the rest of the Islamic world. To this end, they set up the Muslim World League in 1962 to help ferment Islamic unity, but also to serve as a counterweight to other ideologies in the region such as socialism. From 1964 to 1975, the Saudis were led by the capable King Faisal. For all of Nasser's momentum and victories, he did have notable setbacks. In 1961, his union with Syria collapsed after the Syrians seceded, a blow to his calls for Arab unity. From 1962 to 1967, up to 70,000 Egyptian soldiers fought on the Republican side in the North Yemeni Civil War, a conflict which was financially disastrous for the Egyptians and has been appropriately referred to as Egypt's Vietnam by Egyptian historians. The Yemeni royalists were supported by the Saudis. The conflict may be seen as a watershed moment in the Arab Cold War, since Egypt's commitment to the war is almost definitely connected to its horrible performance in the Six Day War. The swift Israeli victory in June 1967 was not only a major defeat for Nasser, but for Arab nationalism as well since it failed to present itself as a viable challenge to Israel. Three years later, in 1970, Nasser died, and the steam of the Arab Cold War fizzled out with his death. His successor, Anwar Sadat, took Egypt down a different path socially and economically, choosing to sever connections to socialism and the USSR. Sadat's Egypt did surprisingly well against Israel in the October 1973 war. But the real winners were the oil exporting Arab countries who weren't even involved in the conflict. Their decision to place an embargo against Israel's Western allies was a shock to Western economies. With Saudi Arabia being the dominant oil exporter, it significantly increased the prestige of many of the traditionalist monarchies in the context of the Arab Cold War. By the late 1970s, a number of incidents had occurred that changed the nature of the contest between conservative monarchies and progressive republics. For instance, President Sadat making peace with Israel in 1978. Upholding the Palestinian cause and the subsequent conflict with Israel was a key identifier of Arab nationalism. Another significant event took place the following year in 1979, when the Iranian Revolution brought an Islamic Republic to power. In some ways, this symbolized the triumph of Islamism, an alternative political model to Western-supported monarchies and secular republics. Thank you guys for watching, make sure you check out the Project Mad playlist for other Cold War videos and don't forget to check out my new channel Street Food Bites if you want to see delicious street food being prepared. 
And obviously I have to thank my patrons for always supporting. Until next time, peace.